Maps, Lisa Miller. Lisa, welcome. Lovely to be able to see you here today. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing great, Carl. And this is so exciting. The first kind of virtual book club. Can't wait. I know, absolutely. We're very fortunate to have met each other through LinkedIn, of course, and perhaps even more fortunate because both of our two books launched around the same time this year. And then perhaps even more fortunate, both of our books touch on the same industry. So I think this was meant to be in many ways. And as much as our networks haven't necessarily brought us together up until now, I'm glad that we've been able to, to connect since. So let's do this, if I may, because we are talking about two of our books today. And let's let's first of all, bring up the two books. Obviously, those of you that know Meredith and I are familiar with our latest book, Delivering the Digital Restaurant, The Path to Digital Maturity. And we'll get more into the book and the role of it in due course. But Lisa, your book, The Business of Joy, uh, which my wife in particular will love because her middle name is Joy. And so she, when I told her about it, she thought, wow, this is fantastic. At last, a book about me. And then I had to tell her, no, because if you read the subhead in there, it's all about the untold lessons from the pandemic and really how we can learn from the pandemic from a business perspective and how perhaps to think about the future. And so, again, looking forward to getting all of your thoughts around that one as well, Lisa. But why don't we start things off? Lisa, would you mind telling everyone a bit about your background, how you came into this industry and how you came to decide to write a book as well? Absolutely. Oh, well, and like I said, I'm so excited to be here. And so just a quick reader's side, just about my background. I do consumer insights for a living. So I'm one of those people that I like to track the consumer sentiments and the behaviors to really help companies grow and accelerate their growth. But my background is a little diverse. Started an ad agency. Then I went to Frito-Lay for about nine years doing Consumer Insights, and then at Brinker Restaurants, which is Chili's, Maggiano's, Macaroni Grill on the border, is where I was the head of innovation. So it's kind of the trifecta around the consumer, advertising, consumer insights, and innovation. And so I decided to write this book about the pandemic because we all know that we were all fearful and we needed a little bit more joy. So I started this passion project and ended up in a book. Fantastic. And of course, we're going to be sharing this video out to your network as well. So for the benefits of folks that perhaps haven't met Meredith and myself first, why don't we have a, a bit of an overview ourselves, Meredith? Do you want to kick us off? Oh, sure. So I'm Meredith Sandlund, and I've spent over a decade now in restaurants, a large part of it at Yum, building restaurants for Taco Bell as the chief development officer. And about halfway through building a thousand restaurants, I thought, man, it's weird that we're building them next to malls when no one goes to malls anymore. And all those restaurants are doing just fine, but it planted a seed and that seed only grew when we tried to enter Manhattan. And I thought, why are we spending the world's most expensive real estate to deliver 40% of our sales out the door? Wouldn't it be great if there was a commissary that we could just deliver tacos out of? And fast forward a few years, I met the guys at Kitchen United who were at that point three guys and an old culinary school. And I thought, oh my gosh, they're making the thing that I as the customer wish existed. And so I joined them and that is where Carl's and my story intersect. Yes, a mutual friend of ours introduced us because I was leading a big company in BP after leading a C-store business of a thousand locations here on the West coast of the States. And I wanted to get into something a bit more entrepreneurial. And our mutual friend said, well, I know a lady who's done something similar. She's gone and left a huge mm. organization, joined up a, with the startup. And so I met Meredith first with the idea of trying to learn about her journey. And then she introduced me to this thing called Ghost Kitchens. And uh, immediately we hit it off rather well. And, you know, I joined up with Kitchen United to help build out their operating model. And it was really through Kitchen United where our idea for the book came to our minds because at that time, this is all pre-pandemic. Restaurants were figuring out whether off-premise was something to take seriously, whether what ghost kitchens were, whether that's really something to take seriously. And I said to Meredith, I said, you know, it'd be great if we could buy our customers, our prospects a book just to help them see what's going on. And she said, great, go ahead, Carl, buy, buy one off Amazon. And I think that's where Meredith's expectation of our book journey would end, quite honestly. But no, no such book existed. And so after we left Kitchen United, we ended up writing the first Delivering the Digital Restaurant book. And of course, it came out during the pandemic. Every restaurant was a ghost kitchen. Every restaurant had to embrace off-premise. And it became an international bestseller. And so from that, it's enabled both for Meredith and myself a bunch of board opportunities, supporting the restaurant ecosystem, and also to my latest venture at Juicer, which is a, a data-driven pricing company, 
helping restaurants use data to make more informed pricing decisions. So that's a bit about us. Let's get into our two books. Now, before I do say anything about the questions that we're going to ask, let's tell people a little bit about how they can get our books. Now, The Business of Joy is available on Amazon. You'll be able to scan that there or go to Amazon. You can see it's available in paperback for just under $20. And I think it's also on Kindle as well. Is that right, Lisa? It is. It's on Kindle and the audio book is coming. Very good. If you'd like to get a copy of our books, you can get both books actually for a combo offer of $30, both the first book that came out a couple of years ago and the more recent one, which is called The Path to Digital Maturity, which is available for $20. But I would suggest you get both. Take a look at the QR code here, get the the two because they go together rather nicely. And if you'd like to not support third parties, come to our own website to do that. The, The website address is www.deliveringthedigitalrestaurant.com. And from there, you'll be able to get that combo. Okay, so let's get on to the story about our two books and how there is some crossover. I think, Meredith, you're going to kick this one off. Yeah, sure. I, I really enjoyed your book, Lisa. So first of all, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. And, oh, and this, I, is, this is super fun. Just to, We're going to go back and forth and talk about the books. It's great. Yeah, absolutely. And I think for me, what was most interesting about it is we're in restaurants because of our guests. And so really focusing in on those guests and their needs is awesome. And I was struck on page 22, you have a quote that says, consumer needs stayed the same, but how consumers access them is what really changed. And that reminded me a lot of Clayton Christensen. He has this concept called jobs to be done when he talks about disruptive innovation. And the jobs to be done for consumers are they need to eat, they need some social engagement, and those jobs remain but how they're getting them done might differ. So how do you think restaurants reconsider from first principles how to address those jobs to be done rather than innovating on the margins to accommodate changing consumers? Well, that's a great question, Meredith. And, you know, as I mentioned to everybody in your network, what I do for a living is the consumer research to help companies find answers to those questions. And in the research that we have, based What happened is everybody obviously had to shut down and people still wanted to eat. Convenience has always been a trend. It just got accelerated. But fast forward where we are today and the jobs are still needing to be done. And so there's so much time and energy, like you said, on the margins of innovation for just that little bit of incremental menu mix. But what's happening is we're kind of forgetting about the basic jobs. Mm. And so a lot of the a lot of the research that I'm doing to help companies find growth today, it's kind of this back to basics. It's not sexy. It's not about innovation, but it's like, how do you deliver that exceptional guest experience consistently day in and day out? And without that, people aren't going to pay the higher prices if the experiences aren't good. So my advice to everybody out there is when it comes to the jobs to be done, make sure before you go innovate that you've got the basics covered and are doing them consistently. I always talk about consistently inconsistent. We've got to deliver exceptional experiences day in and day out before we can innovate on the margins. And so that's what I would tell a lot of folks out there today is shore up the core before you add more. I love that. I think there's something certainly to be said when talking about the off-premise world, because It's the inconsistency that I think drives customers mad, right? If you're selling an expectation for a food package to be delivered within a certain amount of minutes, and you're not convinced that it's going to arrive in that period of time, in many ways, I almost think guests today are almost expecting that it is going to be inconsistent. I think there's so much more opportunity for us to improve the the guest experience. Well, you're right. And I'll just say really quickly, because I know we've got a lot to cover today, but I, I still do a thousand consumer surveys every month. And this last month, I focused about the frustrations on delivery. And you're absolutely right, is that's kind of this tipping. The expectations were a little bit lower, and maybe it's going to be a little bit colder, take a little longer. But given the price increases, We have to focus on the basics. Otherwise, they're not going to choose our brands. They're going to find brands that they can depend on. But why don't, Meredith, can I ask you and Carl a question from your book? And so what's so fun, again, as Carl mentioned, we just, we found each other through LinkedIn. And so I had the opportunity to read Carl and Meredith's book. And again, kudos to you guys for delivering this book. But one of the questions, and it was on page 29 of you guys' book, 
which you guys talked about the digital 3.0 kind of personalization. And one of the things that's on my mind a lot is digital loyalty programs used to be a differentiator for restaurants, but today everybody's doing them. And so my question is, how do we kind of pay it forward and say, how do you really make it competitive and differentiated so it's not just coming across as discounting, it's truly building loyalty and value. So I'd love you guys' thoughts from your book about that. I love that you picked up on that. In, in many ways, in our book, where we chart the path to digital maturity, we don't dedicate one specific section to loyalty. Because in many ways, regardless of where your restaurant is, you can provide different types of loyalty to your customers as you progress through your maturity curve. And so when I think about what digitization can bring, it actually can really embrace all the wonders of e-commerce in so many different ways. And there is a chapter in the book called Guest Centricity, Be Guest Centered. And the whole idea of that is how do you use your customer information to create an experience that actually is more recognizable for them? That means giving the customers that are more value orientated, the value orientated components of what a loyalty program might bring. But as someone once said to me, imagine if you gave the top 1% of McDonald's customers access to the McRib year round, or the, the top 1% of Taco Bell customers, the chance to come in and provide the voice of what this new LTO is going to bring and, and get their opinions. Those types of things can actually resonate really, really strongly with customers. Now, the only way you can do that, of course, is when you've got a way to out, have an outreach and to be able to communicate, but also to understand how their buying behavior really represents and understand as to which segment they fit into. And so I think for us, this is about how do you use data to not just improve the off-premise experience, but the entire omni-channel experience. And I think there's so many exciting ways in which restaurants can embrace this. And we're only on the cusp, I think, of really getting there. But it's first of all, it's about how do you collect that data and, and start to group it in such a way that you identify those behaviors and patterns. Yeah, and I have to say, you had me at data because that's <laughs> my thing, right? And so you're absolutely right. I always say there's so much data, but there's not enough insight that people are really leveraging to, to create those more personalized and customized experience. And everybody's getting the same thing and then nobody feels special anymore. So I love that. And you're right. It's just how do companies really harness that data? I think that's great. Meredith, I know you've got this next question, but before you ask it, let me just read a particular item that I love from Lisa's book. And it said, from first dates to celebrating milestone events, food creates connection. It was not until we were told that our favorite places were now off limits or that our party size had to be under a certain number of guests that many of us realized just how much joy there was in the restaurant experience. I love that, Lisa. Meredith, I think you've got a question that kind of connects to it as well. Absolutely. And I'm going to ask you, Carl, to bring up the bubble chart. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so this is from Lisa's book. And I think this just says it all in one, in one chart, right? And what you see on the X and Y axis here is basically how much joy does it bring you? And did you have to stop doing it? Right. And over there on the far upper right is dine in at restaurants. It brings us tons of joy and we all had to stop doing it. And when you see that, you naturally think, goodness, this seems like the thing that will just come roaring back. And it has come back quite a bit, but transactions remain challenged in the restaurant industry. So I'm curious what you attribute flat transactions to, and then based on your research, what do you think will cause consumers to come back in a way that brings us back to transaction growth in the restaurant industry? Yeah. And honestly, that bubble chart, it literally, that's what I call it, the bubble chart. And just to fill everybody in, it's three dimensions. It's the percent of people that said, um, I miss doing this. And then what am I going to do first? And then how much joy does it bring? And you're right, dine-in is right there. But what happened was, and I remember it like it was yesterday, it was summer of 2020 and the doors opened after all of it being shut down and nobody came back through the doors. And the first reason for that was that they were fearful because with everything going on, lockdown, shutdown, the language of COVID, we became scared of each other. And so we didn't want to go out. Half of America was too scared to step out of their homes and get back to their normal activities. 
But on the other side, the people that were excited to go back out went to restaurants and it was like a foreign planet. You go in and people had masks and it was QR codes and it was single serve everything. And it just felt like a foreign experience. They were looking for a joyful experience and it wasn't that joyful. And so then fast forward to where we are today, we're still unwinding the fear, but now it's less about COVID and now it's fear of the recession, fear of inflation, all of these things. And until we can deliver joyful experiences, people are going to stay home. And the one thing I could just tell everybody, all the restaurants that are out there today, I have all these companies saying, when are they going to come back? When are customers coming back? And I tell them they're never coming back. And what we have to do is reintroduce our brands because people have forgotten about the brands. Sitting at home for 21 days, you forget, you create new behaviors. Imagine two years, two and a half years. I tell clients, make every day feel like a grand reopening. Tell the customers, tell your consumers why they fell in love with your brand in the first place. Because we, as consumers, we've forgotten about your brands and we've replaced it with other things. So that's why it's been such a struggle. There's still fear but the other thing is we've forgotten about why we love a brand in the first place. Hmm, so those are the two things. And at a macro things. level, if we've forgotten all the brands, that would explain our behavior industry-wide. Yeah. And those brands that actually did lean into advertising early, reminding the consumers about why they fell in love with the brand proposition, because otherwise everything becomes commoditized. And you know what happens when things are commoditized, it's transacting on price. And if that's the case, then why have brands? And so you've got to remind people why they fell in love and it's brand advertising. And that is foreign to a lot of people instead of LTOs and deals mm -hmm. and all of that. You've got to just remind them of those broader issues. So actually, it's a really good transition when you think about falling in love with brands in the first place, when the intersection with what you guys are writing was around that page 106, 107, and it's the rise of digitization in person and on premise. And the reason I was curious about that is when we talk about joy and that, how do I provide that joyful experience? I want to understand that high touch and high tech. And one of the fun examples that you guys had was the coffee experience versus the treat. So I'd love to have you guys tell me more about that digitization for on-premise. Mm -hmm. Well, to some extent, I think it might differ by age group and you could probably tell us better looking through the data. I think of my seven-year-old son who loves to go to Starbucks. Like this is like the biggest treat for him that he can imagine is that I'll take him to Starbucks after school. And he is downright afraid of talking to the baristas. He will not order mm -hmm. on site. But if I hand him my phone and say, hey, will you place an order while I'm driving over there? He is like, yes, absolutely. And for him, that experience of going to the physical place, being around other people, spending time with me, having a cake pop, let's be honest, it's probably mostly the sugar <laughs> that he's interested in. Um, that is the experience for him. Talking to the barista, not so much, doesn't care. And for someone else, that interaction, particularly in an older cohort, I imagine is more important. But for his age, that part that get procuring the cake pop is like that, that should be as efficient as possible. Enjoying the cake pop should be the part that he's focused on. What we call that, it's like what you just described is building that moment in memory that builds loyalty mm -hmm. because it's just like Oreos and milk or baseball games and hot dogs, movies and popcorn. Starbucks for you and your son is going to be that moment in memory. So it's a perfect example of blending it. That's where the, the, the technology really can help create a better moment actually, right? Yeah, absolutely. Now I have also been to restaurants where they have say put a kiosk out front and they're not there to help you learn how to use it. And you go in and you're not sure who to talk to. You, you don't really know how to use the kiosk. You're not sure what happens next because they haven't honestly done a good job using the technology to give you cues of how to go through the process. And to me, that is more a failure of technology than it is an absence of humans, which might mm. say a lot about my comfort <laughs> with technology. But 
to others in different age cohorts or from different backgrounds, they are going to see that as an absence of humans, not as a failure of technology. And I think we have to remember where we are in this cycle. It's early adoption. And when they put kiosks in at the airport, we all hated them. And now we consider it like something has gone horribly awry if we have to talk to someone at the counter, right? We are at the very beginning stages of that in restaurants. So unless you have excellent technology, you need to make sure that you're supporting it with humans throughout the process and still making it feel warm and understandable. I love that because it is, it's the the human touch at the right point, but I love the fact, because I've been to those places where it is the failure of technology. So you're absolutely right. Yeah. Okay, let's let's move on. Just first of all, for those of you tuning in to us, if you have any questions for myself, Meredith, Lisa, please put them in the comments below. We'd love to answer them offline later. Feel free to get in touch with us because we'd love to get your thoughts about what we're discussing. And if you have already read either of our books, let us know what you think. We'd love to hear from you. Talking of hearing from you, Lisa, I would love to hear from you about a particular tactical aspect that was referenced in your book by the CEO of Zalat Pizza. The line I took from it was the pizza gram is a simple, no cost value add tactic that creates a brand moment that guests appreciate it. So a couple of questions here. What's a pizza gram and how do brands think about embracing joy in an off-premise context? And I'll just add to that, if I may, in the sense that I think a lot of restaurants really fear the off-premise channel because they don't have as much control over how they can create joy. But I think this particular thing really was a great example of how you can. Yeah, and I think, let me give everybody the backstory of that. If you think about the pizza category, while a lot of restaurants, full service, were just ghost towns, right? He was sharing the story about you turn the corner onto one of his locations in Dallas and there's just literally a line down the street. And because they were using third-party delivery drivers, they literally even had little driver bubbles, like lines on the parking lot. So these drivers would stay in their bubbles. But what happened was, is he started thinking about is the fact that we were missing those emotional connections. So what he did, again, a very simple idea. He asked his staff to write notes on the box, literally with a Sharpie in the box these little nice notes to say, have a great day. You know, hope you enjoy the pizza. Just little personalized notes. And it was crazy. Everybody was talking about it on social media. And it was especially at that moment in time where we were all feeling so afraid of each other that there was a human being on the other side of that delivery order that somebody cared about me that day. And so that pizza gram was something that was just such a again, costs nothing. It costs the cost of a Sharpie. And it just made a very important connection with the customers, even though they were using an outsourced driver. And so that's just one example of how I really do worry about delivery becoming commoditized in a transaction. And I think that's part of why the delivery dilemma is happening right now, is it costs more money and the experience is less good and so why are they doing that? And so we're, we're transacting with our delivery customers. And I will tell you from research again, just from last month, is if the in-restaurant experiences had as abysmal scores as these delivery scores, people would be all over it in a nanosecond. And so it's shocking to me that we've allowed these bad experiences in delivery continue, but it's those little moments and memories, kind of like you were talking, Meredith, is that people will remember that somebody wrote that little personal note. And so I think it starts, it starts with how do you do that? And I don't have all the answers to that. And I'd love to brainstorm with people out there to say, how can we really make a delivery experience more customized, more personal to build a brand, not just a transaction? But he's a, it was a great, a great story that he shared with me. Well, one of the things, can I ask you guys a question hmm. on that topic? And either one of you could answer that, but building on that. So if we think about that pizza, the pizza gram was written by the store or the store employee in your guys book, you guys talked about how do you make the drivers feel a part of the team? And I think that was such a good insight. When I was reading that, it was like such a powerful moment because right now the delivery people 
are probably the low men on the totem pole when those are interacting with customers. So I'd love for you guys to talk about that, but then also the branding on the to-go packaging. And who do you guys think is doing that well today? Like who's doing the best practices for that? I'll tackle the driver question, then let Meredith tackle the packaging one. Drivers absolutely have a huge role to play in this ecosystem. For our first book, I became a DoorDash driver, Lisa, and I didn't particularly feel well treated, quite honestly. And it really helped Mm. me realize that it's important to think about how restaurants can make them feel part of the team. Some of the best out there do exactly that. And what do I mean by that? They offer them free drinks. They offer them access to the restrooms. They offer them free little samples of the LTOs that are coming out. And when that is really deployed well, then you're creating a level of service so that when the package is being delivered to a customer's front door, they say, well, you know, enjoy this particular curry tonight. But by the way, I've just tried the new tikka masala. It's coming out next week. Make sure to get that. That is a great way of helping restaurants feel part of the team. And if you treat them right, then they're also going to stay in this thing called the red zone, which is an area where drivers are going to hang out to know that they're going to get orders from restaurants in that particular area at a certain level of frequency, which is great for everyone. It's better for the restaurants because the food can get out the door faster. It's better for the guests because the guest gets the food faster. And also another reason is the driver wants to deliver that food because they like the whole environment of supporting that restaurant. And there are folks out there, Buca de Pepper, I think, have really deployed a lot of things with regards to supporting drivers. And so they're the ones I'll call out. I will say on the driver point, they are driving for a reason, and that is to make money. And what they care about is making money. And if you make them wait, they will make less money. And I think Mm. being aware of that and how I think restaurants have a tendency to deprioritize the off-premise orders to focus on who's right in front of them. Maybe not great, right? Because you're now saying, driver, you're not important to me. Your livelihood is not important to me. And that sends a very strong message. So something else to consider there is how do you keep them busy? Keeping them busy will keep them coming back. With regards to the packaging, we talk about this a lot, frankly, in both books. But the idea here (laughs) is that when you are remotely interacting with a consumer, you need to have an unboxing experience. This is Mm -hmm. something that was first made famous, I think, by Apple but now has been really adopted in tech, right? Think in tech, most of us don't buy our tech by going into a store. Most of us get it online and it shows up at our house. And so making that experience pleasurable, making that experience branded, and if you're really good, making it so good that people are going to take videos and pictures of it and share it online, that's when you've succeeded. And that doesn't necessarily mean going all the way to tons of high cost, thick paper stock with tons of ink on it. That might be right for some brands. For other brands, it's maybe having a very eco-friendly set of packaging that really resonates with their brand's positioning about their care for the environment. It's different for every brand, but making sure that it's consistent with your brand and that it is easy to open and so beautiful and features the food and makes the food look good. All of these things are going to make the consumer more likely to associate that food and that great experience with the brand, but also make them more likely to share your brand with others. Yeah, I think those are great points. And I think that the packaging, again, it creates that that joy and it's fun and exciting. Mm -hmm. And I would just build on one quick thing about the employee is that I I always say there's a chapter in my book called the customer isn't always right. Mm -hmm. And what I was telling is that the consumers created part of the labor shortage for restaurants because of the customer bad behavior. So I would actually tell everybody out there listening is that while we're operators, we're marketers, we're restauranteurs, it's we're also customers. So we need to, when we do delivery, let's do our best to treat those delivery drivers with a smile and kindness too, because we want them to keep coming back to work. So I think that that's also just an important message, but building those brand moments is really, those those are great examples, Meredith. So then moving on to John Sawinski, who you reference a number of times in the book. At the time, I think he was the president of Applebee's, Mm -hmm. which went through a huge transformation uh, under his leadership. And one of the big pieces of transformation was that they went from 13% off premise to, I think I've heard most recently, 25% curbside. And when you add to that delivery, I'm sure it's even higher than that. And they were doing that at the same time that the brand was really promoting nostalgic messaging that was prompting guests to come back to the brand in restaurant. 
Can you talk a little bit about why you think that off-premise number has remained elevated, even as Applebee's has outperformed the category and is continuing to have folks come back in? And do you think that shift is representative? I know we already talked about probably consumers will never go back, but think about their behavior of on-prem versus off-prem. Where do you think we're likely to settle out? John is just such a great guy and a great brand president, and I've known him for a number of years. But let me just give you a little bit of the backstory and it'll connect the dots. I'm glad we're talking about this particular one. When I talked about reintroducing the brand, inviting them back, making it feel like a grand opening every day, John leaned into that way early into the pandemic with Welcome Back and just this beautiful nostalgia commercials. And they actually, if you go back and really look at it, there are a lot of people saying, why did you do that too early? You're inviting people back. But what he did was exactly what I talked about earlier is he reminded people why they loved Applebee's. It's the nostalgia, big hero food, the connections. And they literally went out and shot real people. And I think it was some small town in Pennsylvania. Those were all real people. And America connected. And he'll talk about America was hungry to recreate, reconnect. And that's what happened. So all the waters rose. Then, then it reminded them, well, I can't maybe come in right now, but I want to do the to-go. And so advertising the brand helped both the takeout, delivery, and dine-in. And they, they had an amazing run during a global pandemic. And to talk about the fact about off-premise versus dine-in, the reality of it is, is think about in your own world, what do you want for dinner tonight? I don't know. What do you want? And you, oh, let's go there. No, let's go there. And people banter back and forth. At the end of the day, the carryout occasion, the dine-in occasion, the delivery occasion, they are all different occasions. Mm. So they're incremental. It's not cannibalizing one for the other. I've been in this business for a long time. And that notion of incrementality Still, people don't understand, but that's how they've been able to sustain that growth. And the reason they're outperforming everybody else, obviously they're executing in the stores, but they're also, they're reminding the consumers why they fell in love Mm -hmm. with the brand. Big hero food, great music, and that's that's why it's working. And will they ever go back? You already answered that (laughs) question is no. Well, and I, they're never going back. I absolutely love the idea that these are different occasions. And there are so many restaurants I hear say, well, my highest margin channel is when consumers do takeout. So I want to encourage them to stop ordering even first party delivery and do takeout instead. Or I, I want to make sure my restaurants are full. So I want to get them to stop doing third party delivery and come to dine. But they're different occasions. And if you look at it through that lens, you would say, The job to be done for each of those occasions is different. And you're never going to get someone to switch from one to another if the job to be done is related to that occasion. I think that is very interesting. And then the question becomes, how do you best serve each of those occasions? Well, I will tell you that, again, just this data from last month is nine out of 10 delivery occasions start by already knowing the brand. And so if if you haven't reintroduced why your brand is good for either whether it's dining or delivery, you're going to not be on the list. That's amazing. So, that's an amazing stat. So that's overall, and yes, Gen Z and millennials, but seven out of 10 for Gen Z and millennials, they still know the brand. Wow. So they might start on a third party site, but they already know the brand. Because yeah. again, what do you want for dinner? I don't know. What do you want for dinner? And you pick a brand. And then you can say, okay, delivery, am I going to carry out or whatever? But it starts with the food. And so that's literally hot off the press. I'm going to be posting that in the next week. But I think it's a shocking number that people think people are browsing apps for brands. Even Gen Z isn't really doing that very often. Seven out of 10 occasions, they already know the brand they Hmm. want. I can't believe we've gone through our 35 minutes or so, so quickly. Lisa, we've really enjoyed this. I'd love for people to be able to know, how do they reach out to you? How how do they get in touch? What are the best ways? And let me bring this back up here as well about your book. Sure. Yeah. The best way to honestly find is my company name is my name, Lisa W. Miller. But really the best way to find me is you do a hashtag journey back to joy And you'll find my website, you'll find my LinkedIn and YouTube with all my content. But I I hope to hear from some of the folks listening today. 
but it's been so fun and I can't wait to do more of these. Great stuff. Well, thank you so much. Again, if you'd like to reach out to us, you can get a copy of Delivering the Digital Restaurant, The Path to Digital Maturity, www.deliveringthedigitalrestaurant.com. All books through different formats are available on Amazon as well. And also tune into our podcast called The Digital Restaurant, which is where Meredith and I talk about the five biggest headlines affecting the world of restaurants, off-premise and technology. So two good books. If you haven't got your summer reading ready, then hopefully you'll have a chance to check out both Lisa and Meredith in my book. But thank you everyone for listening. Lisa, it's been a real pleasure and we'll speak again soon.